Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Mondays with Maishi. This is Moshe Norman out in Lakewood, New Jersey, which is a little town that's become a big town and maybe even a big city down in central New Jersey. And tonight, I have the honor of interviewing and speaking with, with you and with the great Liana Lowenstein, who is a licensed clinical social worker out in Toronto. Now, do they have licensed clinical social workers in Toronto? I know that the the disciplines work a little differently there. Don't yeah, they? we're we're really called reg registered social workers is yes. the correct term. Okay, so is that the equivalent of an LCSW? It's the, the equivalent of a licensed okay. clinical social okay. worker, yeah. So, so a registered social worker, registered, what did you call it? A reg registered social worker. Registered social worker in yeah. Canada. So, but that, what we you know, in our language, we call that uh, LCSWs and... Um, I really appreciate that you agreed to come on. Um, I just, I do want to say that Liana is the author of, I believe it's 12 books on child play, family therapy, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, you know, I guess maybe I'll, I'll put up a, a picture, you know, soon of the Amazon versions of the book so that everyone <laughs> can kind of get a look. But 12 books is 12 more than I've written. And 12 more than probably most of you have written. So it's, it's really an honor to have you on. And I appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, working with kids uh, is certainly uh, a niche that, um, interestingly, many people are like afraid to get into. It's like we're, we're comfortable working with adults who fe we feel a certain collegial connection with. Um, maybe we feel we could connect or relate to them better. But with children who we all once were at some point, presumably, <laughs> right? Unless it's something... Uh, I don't know about. Um, so it's, people are kind of like scared and weary of yeah. working, and and I think there's some some legitimate reasons for that, but uh, some probably illegitimate fears in working with kids. So, you know, one one of the things I think we all know is in order to work with children, we have to somehow find our own personal child and let that come out a little bit. Uh, some of the some of the child experts that I've interviewed have been silly and shown tons of personality and very easy, you know, and, and uh, uninhibited. And that's a great asset that they have, th that they bring to the world of working with kids. Liana, tell me a little bit about who you are, how you got into the field of working with children and the expertise, then ultimately the expertise, um, you're, you know, of working with children and the particular expertise of art and play. Tell me a little bit about that. So, um, so I'm both a child and family therapist in, in Toronto, as you mentioned, and um, uh, I, I'm also a child psychotherapist. So I've had specific training in play, play therapy, um, and have gone through a fairly intensive, um, you know, play therapy certificate uh, training program. And I'm also a play therapist supervisor. So I supervise um people who are um, who are in the training program and uh, and even, you know, have been uh, been working in the field for many years. So I, I, I consult to both beginning therapists as well as seasoned therapists. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really passionate about the use of play um, when working with with children and families, because I think it's, you know, the way uh, to engage and reach. Um, and, you know, I think there are some who have been trained um, and, and you know, have, you know, lots of experience working with children and are nervous about working with families. Mm -hmm. And then there are those who have been trained in working with families or adults and are nervous about working with kids. I think what we're here to talk about tonight is the beautiful marriage of these two worlds, working with kids working with adults and how you can blend the two. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're working with families, uh, what better way to engage all members than through play? Amazing. So th th you're assuming, I guess, that adults can also enjoy play. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I think there might be some initial discomfort, um, but one of the guidelines that I suggest if you are going to be integrating um, play or art um, in a family session is to prep the parents ahead of time um, by, you know, it's like sort of don't just sort of go into the family session and bring in an activity and say, okay, we're going to do this. I would say first prep the parents ahead of time and explain 
your rationale. Why um, do you want to engage the whole family in a play activity or an art activity? Um, so I might say, you know, if we were to just do traditional talk therapy, well, that wouldn't be very engaging for the children in the session. Um, they might start to act out because they're bored. They may have difficulty articulating how they feel. Um, and uh, but if you use a, a playful activity, um, well, it's kind of it, first of all, it's pleasurable. Like we, you know, we all I think love games, for example, and um, arts can certainly be a wonderful way to communicate. Um, and so it's a way to engage all family members in a pleasurable task. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that it can also lead to really rich, valuable information, assessment information. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, if you were to ask the family, so why are you here today? What are some of the struggles? Um, well, you might get a response. You might get an, I don't know. Um, but you might get a response. But if you were to engage the family in an art activity, um, you know, draw a picture all together as a family on this one large sheet of paper uh, and show me um, uh, sort of a typical day in the life of your family or um, what it would look like in your family with problems all gone. And then, uh, you know, observe the family dynamics and the interactional patterns. Well, you're going to get lots of rich, valuable information through that playful art-based activity. So this information is coming through observation, I'm assuming. So yeah, that's one way, one way to integrate play or art through, you know, a family assessment activity, for example. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I have a question for you. This is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, so I want to get it out of the way. Yeah. But um, is there a difference or can you explain the difference between play therapy versus playing in therapy or playing during therapy? So play therapy is really so the term play therapy is really um you know a term that we use when we're talking about um this technique that's being used by trained mental health professionals for therapeutic purposes mm -hmm. so you can't call yourself a play therapist or using play therapy unless you have specific training um and, you know, in play therapy and, you know, really making use of the powers of play um, in a therapeutic setting. So I, I would say that, um, you know, those are sort of two important guidelines when we're using the term play therapy. OK, because because I, I think what I'm what I'm driving at is um, can you play during therapy without having a particular agenda and um, through the work of whatever play you're doing? in some way intervene. So, it, right, in other words, in, in my mind, play therapy was like a specific um, organized uh, activity where I know what I'm getting at, I know what I'm doing, um, and I'm targeting specific things, sort of like you might do in floor time or DIR, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where, where it's like, I'm, I'm playing, doing play therapy. But now I'm, I'm wondering sometimes, what if we just play during therapy? Are there things that will happen that will emerge and that we'll be able to in some way intervene on a therapeutic level if we just play during therapy? Um, yeah, I would say, you know, yes, you could. But, um, you know, I, I would say that there is a concern about using it in a haphazard way without the, the, the training and theoretical underpinning mm -hmm. of play therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is it not enough, you know, just let's say for us to play during therapy and then during the play it, it enables us to giggle together, to make eye contact, to get closer. And so there's like a relational attachment piece that's that's happening, even without play being um, in some way, again, organized. Yeah. So certainly you could be playful. You could be a playful therapist. That's right. Because yeah, um, right? you could be therapy. a playful therapist who isn't a trained play therapist. <laughs> yeah. so yeah. You're saying there's a difference, but but both can actually be helpful. Yeah, yes, I would say so. Um, we just want to caution people to uh, not say, well, I'm a play therapist or I'm using play therapy without the, the training, um, the theoretical underpinnings, um, you know, the sort of knowledge of why I'm, 
I, I've had the training to do this. This is why I'm doing it. These are the, the this is the purpose. Uh, this is the theoretical framework that I'm using. Okay. I, I just want to remind everybody, for those of you who could turn on your videos, of course, that's always wonderful. We appreciate that. So we can be more interactive and see live faces. And for those of you who'd like to question or comment, please use the reactions tab that is found on the bottom right of your screen. Click on it and click the raise hand button. Um, I'm very proud of the many of you older folks who've learned to do this <laughs> um, since our inception a couple of years ago. Thanks for those of you who turned on your video and are chuckling because that's some good feedback for me. Okay, I'm being playful. All right, I'm trying. <laughs> um, okay, so tell us a little bit about the about the actual use of play during family sessions. Are, are we talking about, again, something organized or is this, and what is the therapist facilitating? What is the therapist looking for? Not just in the assessment. I understand we're going to, you know, we always, we're always assessing in the yeah. session, even if we don't use play and we just do anything, we can um, uh, uh, sort of assess what's going on in the way the family interacts with each other. You know, this is classical family kind of work where we're assessing and picking up different patterns uh, that right. we see just in the regular uh, uh, give and take and dialogue that goes on. What are we looking, what are we trying to accomplish during play therapy and how are we doing it? Um, well, I guess, first of all, there's a difference between um, family assessment and and then family treatment. So let me first begin by talking about family assessment. Um, so in in um, in a family assessment, we might use um, a therapeutic game or an art technique or puppets or sand tray um, to assess the family dynamics and the interactional patterns. So example of one activity uh, that I call the family gift. So I'll say to the family, um, let's imagine, um, or, or I'd like you to, I'd like you to choose a gift. Um, it can only be one gift for your family and it has to be something that you all need and want. So your first task as a family is to imagine that you, get to choose any gift, any gift in the world. And it doesn't even have to be a gift that money can buy, uh, but it can only be one gift. And you have to all agree on, the, on what this one gift is going to be. Um, and once they've decided on the gift, and as they're deciding on the gift, you're again, you're observing like, so who's making the decisions? Uh, if, you know, one of the kids sort of says, well, how about this? Um, another one of the other kids says, well, how about this? And one suggestion is ignored and the other one is the one that everyone goes with. So, you know, so you're kind of looking for that. Who's what, you know, whose decisions are accepted and whose are ignored, who's making the final de decision. Um, uh, did anyone sort of do anything kind of hostile? Um, are the parents able to set appropriate limits? Um, is it chaotic or is there, is there one who always pulls back? And, and... Yeah. Um, what about what kind of emotions are expressed? Um, at, you know, so once they sort of like decided, then you ask them to, you could either, you could either bring in a whole bunch of different art supplies and have them create the gift using the art supplies, or you could have them just draw the gift together as a family. So you get them one big sheet of paper and you say, okay, well, now you, now that you've decided on what the gift is going to be. I want you to draw the gift. And again, you're observing the dynamics. Um, are they are they playful? Are they serious? Um, is one, is a parent sort of being very kind of um, controlling and the other parent is disengaged? Um, uh, are they talking to each other? Um, what happens is what, if one of the kids acts out, how are the parents managing that? So you're observing all of those kinds of things. Um, and then you might ask them afterwards some process questions like, um, you know, who decided on what the gift should be? Um, how did you feel as you were deciding on the gift and then drawing the gift? Um, if something kind of, um, if there was like this negative interaction, let's say the two kids or let's some, you know, two of the kids started to get into an argument about you know, which marker, which color marker, um, you know, they each wanted, um, like fighting over the, you know, the red marker. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the kids was yelled at, I might ask, you know, does this kind of thing happen at home? And if you were at home, how would this be handled? 
Um, how did you feel when this happened? Um, so you're, you're observing, you're assessing, you're processing, and you're using this playful activity to do all that. So that's an example of a family assessment activity. Uh -huh. And then of course, um, you know, you have a treatment plan with specific goals. Um, and um, yeah, so the treatment, treatment, treatment plan phase, was a specific goals. Uh, when you're doing this kind of intervention, is this is this more uh, where the family is coming in complaining about one particular child? Let's say, you know, that would be the typical. So to the treatment goals, are they going to sort of focus on or hyper-focus on one identified pace, patient, so to say? And that's well, okay. That's okay. I think that's the beauty of doing family therapy. It takes the focus off of the identified patient and really communicates to the family that this is, you know, an issue that, you know, everyone plays a, a role in making it better rather than just let's fix the child, let's focus on the problem child. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I love about being a family therapist is that um, you're really communicating, you know, everyone in the family plays a part in making it better mm -hmm. rather than just focusing on the, the problem child. Excellent. So, okay, so we have the family and we've done some assessing and we're also doing processing and creating self-awareness you know, or systemat system, systematic self-awareness or systemic self-awareness of the system. Yep. Uh, so um, the family now is starting to recognize that there are patterns that take place vis-a-vis -vis this exploration. Yeah. They're learning that, well, yeah, I guess he is the harsh one. Well, yeah, I guess I do withdraw. Well, yeah, I guess this, this is, you know, they might chide or chuckle about it, just like we would do um, in non-play family systems work. Right? Yeah, and could I, could I just interject for a moment and just say that um, one of the things that I often do um, is, you know, videotape the session, mm -hmm. not just for my own purposes, because inevitably, you know, you know, especially if it's a large family, there's so much going on, you're going to miss stuff. So it, it could be helpful for you as a therapist to, mm -hmm. to videotape and then play back for yourself to see what you missed. But you could um, show, show parts of the video back to either the whole family or maybe just the parents and say, you know, what do you see going on here? Um, let's say there was a difficult moment in the session um, where, you know, the parent was getting really frustrated with, with one of the kids and maybe there was, you know, they, they, they became really frustrated. Maybe there was some yelling going on. You know, I might ask the parent, you know, stop the video at that point and say, you know, how are you feeling in that moment? How do you think um, Moishi is feeling in this, you know, the, the child, I think Moishi is feeling right now. Um, so rather than me telling the family, this is what I see, this is what I think the problem is, mm -hmm. when you videotape it and you show it back, um, it really let, lends itself to the family really getting insight into their own interactional patterns and issues. They could see themselves from the outside. Exactly. Okay. And using play, it makes it a lot less threatening. They, they probably also feel, in other words, because they were having fun and it was kind of lighthearted, it's easier for them to watch rather than, than when they're in more of a defensive mode because they felt the tension, you know. Right, right. And a lot of stuff is coming out um, really kind of just through the play um, or the art technique that might be difficult to just communicate directly. Okay, so let's let's move further into now treatment. So so treatment, you always want to have you know a treatment plan with specific goals, and then some thoughts about well, okay, let's say the goal is to um, help the parents focus more, focus on and attend um, on the positive behavior, encourage uh, more positive, desirable behavior in the children and for the parents to praise that desirable behavior. So let's say that's one of the goals. Um, then again, you can use playful activities to achieve that goal. Um, and I think that you're gonna have much greater success than just talking about it. Um, so I don't know if now's a good time, but I do have a video I could show that kind of will bring this to life. Would you like sure. me to, yeah? Sure. Okay. Let's do it. So, uh, let me just set it up for a moment then. So this is the family that you're going to see in this video um, is um, this is not an actual client. This is a, a colleague of mine, a, a former um, supervisee 
um, and her two children. And um, uh, this activity I'm going to show you um, is called um, Opposite. Uh, and um, the goal is to um, encourage better kind of compliance, um, but also help parents focus on um, on praising desirable behavior, sort of through this playful activity. Um, okay, so as you're watching the video, um, first of all, in terms of the sound, you might need to turn it up or turn it down on your end. So just play with your own volume to adjust it. And then we'll talk about it afterwards. Um, and if you could just sort of come on and just confirm with me that you can see it and hear it okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a shout out. Okay. So you can see it okay? Yep. You and me, we're gonna be well, the okay. judges and our job is to watch your mom and your sister to see if they're doing a good job. You're also gonna help me keep score. Your job, mom, is to be the challenger. Okay. And Serena, your job is to be Miss Opposite Lady. Okay, that's your role. You're gonna be Miss Opposite Lady. So, mom, you're gonna be the challenger. And you're going to give Serena, Miss Opposite Lady, mm -hmm. a command. For example, stand up. Now you're Opposite Lady. So when mom says, stand up, you, that's right, you're going to do the opposite. So you're going to ignore what mom is asking you to do, and you're going to do the absolute opposite. Okay? And your sister actually gets a point when she does the opposite. Okay? If she does what your mom wants her to do, like if she does what her, your mom asks her to do, she doesn't get a point. Stand okay. up. Not listening. Okay, good job. Miss Opposite Lady, she gets one point. So can you draw a one? Serena, look up. Look up. No, look, look up there. No, no, that's down. Look up. Come on, look up. <laughs> She's giggling. Look up. Okay. Did she do a good job? Yeah, because she did the opposite. She did exactly what her mother, your mom said not to do, right? She did the opposite. She gets another point. Serena, I would like you to take two steps forward. No, no, no. Two steps forward, please. Two steps forward. <laughs> okay. All right. Did she take two steps forward? She did two steps back, which is exactly what she was supposed to do. Okay, she gets another point. Okay, so now we're going to play it again. But this time... I'm going to read the instructions this time. So you're going to be the challenger again, Mom. And this time, instead of being Miss Opposite Lady, you're going to be Good Listener. Can you guess what that is? Um, you do what Mom says. That's right. Okay, so when Mom gives you a command, you're going to do what she says. And if you do what she says, you get a point. Now, there's also an extra part here. Remember, Mom, you and I talked about the brag book. Right. Right? And we talked that you've learned how to do labeled praise. Yes. Okay? So each time your daughter mm -hmm. does the command, does the desirable behavior that you've asked her to do, yes. you're going to give her a labeled praise. Okay. Okay? Yeah. And then, Mom, you get a chance to earn some points, too. Yes. Okay? So let's see if you can earn four points for showing good listening, and if you can earn four points by using labeled praise properly. Okay. Okay, are you gonna be my helper again? Yeah? Serena, so. stand up. Um, okay, so I, be, um, I really liked how you listened right away and you, and you stood up and did what I asked you to do. So good job. Okay, great job. All right, excellent. excellent. Serena, please uh, walk two steps forward. <laughs> I love the playlist there. Okay. Are you having fun? I can see you 
you giggling? Yes? Okay. Um. <laughs> okay, so labeled, um, Serena, I really appreciated um, that you, you know, did, did what I asked you to do without um, arguing or without asking me why. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Perfect. How does it feel when mom gives you compliments? Good. Yeah? Okay. And how does it feel when your daughter listens? Amazing. Amazing? <laughs> All right. So, so much this, easier. This is a feel good for both of you. How do you think your mom feels when she asks your daughter, your sister to do something and your sister doesn't listen? How do you think that makes mom feel? Does he think it makes mom feel happy or not happy? Not happy. Not happy. Okay. And... When your sister was listening, and your mom skate, said like that she was doing a good job with listening, do you think that made your sister feel happy or not happy? Happy. Happy? So, so it feels good to get praise, right? Yes. Yeah? And how did that feel for you to, um, to, to give that praise, like to think of a label praise? Um, it felt good. I mean... It also made me stop and think because, you know, usually uh, it's much easier just to be like, oh, great job, or um, just like, you know, g general things. So yes. to specifically say something about what she just did, it felt good, but also a little bit unnatural. Yeah. Um, but it made me realize that that makes much more sense. Much more sense. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Excellent. Let's just, hold on, let's just stand up and just get our wiggles at first oh. before I ask a few more questions. Stomp our feet five times and then freeze our body for five seconds. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Go. Switch places with the first person that you look at with your eyes. <laughs> okay, yes. And let's do it again. <laughs> and first. <laughs> All right, we're back. So I asked your sister this question, so I'll ask you now. So how about... Um, how do you think? How do you think your mom feels when she asks your sister to do something, and your sister doesn't listen the first time? How does that make mom feel? Do you think? Angry. It makes mom feel angry. Can you think of a time when your sister showed good listening to mom? And if you can't think of a time. So I think I'm going to pause it now because I think you get the idea. Mm -hmm. um, the, the sort of the next part is having them sort of go home and track it. So well, why, um, don't, why don't we pause it now and then we, we could revisit more later because there's so much content that just happened that like I'm getting overwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> All my questions. Yeah, good. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to just kind of just give you a bit of a snapshot of an example. I mean, I have so many different videos I could show. I have like videos of families doing puppet shows and art activities but but i just want to understand what happened here and yeah first and then and then so let's stop the share okay amazing what do you want to share about this before um well i think that one of the reasons i'm out of all the different videos i could have chosen um one of the reasons why i chose this one is because number one it didn't require any materials mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a playful activity um, that doesn't require any material. So really any therapist could kind of do it. Um, and I think it's a good example of something that is playful um, around an issue that so many families present with in therapy. I mean, I think, I think so many parents, you know, want to address when kids are not listening or non-compliant. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, when, you know, when you have a child or children in the family who are, you know, not listening, um, parents get frustrated and often there's this negative interaction that happens and it's like a lot of negative interaction. Yeah, and one way to shift that is by having parents really focus on and attend and praise desirable behavior. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why I chose this particular video to show. So this, the video wasn't, wasn't about, wasn't per se about, uh, Selena, complying as much as it was about mom uh, uh, giving energy, giving positive energy to her compliance. Yeah. Well, it was both. 
mm -hmm. both, kind of achieving both goals. Um, I'm increasing wondering compliance and increasing positive parent-child interaction and increasing parents' ability to use labeled praise. So accomplishing several goals all at once. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I do want to say that it was it was actually um, quite lovely to watch you watch this because you were you were showing on my screen and you were in, enjoying it immensely. Yeah, I would wonder about that, but maybe we could put that aside. But you know, you seem to be be proud of the intervention and enjoying it. Well, just take me back to like the like I love seeing kids giggle. Yeah, like right. I mean, it's it's kind of infectious. Okay. Um, the beginning of the intervention started off with you instructing the, the daughter to be oppositional. Can you talk to that for a minute? Well, um, you know, I'm basically, um, ha you know, having her first be a, not a good listener so that then she could transition to being a good listener. Mm -hmm. Right. But so that, that's kind of one way to achieve the goal. First, if you, if you would have just told her to, to comply, she may not have. Perhaps not. Is that, is that what I think that's to... part of the playful nature of this activity by kind of role playing being a bad listener. I see. I see. I mean, because in my mind, there's a big paradox in that, which is essentially by you telling her to not comply and she's getting excited and complying with that, she is become she is being compliant with you. Right. Exactly. Yes. So now, now she wins your approval, which makes her feel special because you're you're approving of her. She you, you instruct her to do something maladaptive, so to say, right? So that's exciting for her because she gets to not comply, but yeah. by not complying, she's complying, and that's a paradox. Right. And then, yeah. of course, she's going to be much more uh, receptive to complying when you tell her to comply because you're yes. already, you're already very well attached with her. You got it. Is that is that deliberate? Yes. Okay. Amazing. So a paradox. Yeah, you, you, you put that so much more eloquently than what how I put well, it. So I've been studying paradox for for a long time. So to yeah. me, there is like a very open paradox. Yeah. Um, can we take a question from Liba? Yes. Hi, Liba. Liba, you can unmute and. Hi, and Liba, I, th I think you work with kids, right? Um, some actually, Liana. Any kind of success I've had with any kids. Um, is thanks to you. <laughs> I Thank really, you. I really love your work. I have three of your books. I've gone with through the um, Corey deals with sexual abuse with a client and crazy. <laughs> You're amazing. Yeah. Um, I was very surprised about um, like when you in, in the video when you were very direct with a mom about what she was going to do in terms of her praise. Um, almost like like uh I don't know I, I don't know maybe it's <laughs> maybe it's like a, a a misconception on my part of that I don't know if, if I were the kid in that experience um and hearing the therapist tell my mom now tell Lipa that she did a great job like I don't know I, mm -hmm. And, and seeing my mom then do it at home, <laughs> mm -hmm. I kind of almost would want it to be a secret between her and the therapist. I don't know, again, like you, how do you find that working out after the session's over now that, that you've directly talked about the intervention in front of the kids? I think it, it, it helps to just open communication. Like it shows that we can all talk about this um, and everyone knows what we're doing um and then when the instruction is you know okay so go home and you know um look for desirable be be you know behavior to praise for example the kids sort of have already gotten used to this mom's gotten used to it we've talked about it openly um and so everyone knows what to expect when they go home so i i think i think that you know modeling open direct communication in a family session is one way to help families be able to more openly communicate at home outside of the session. Yeah. Mm. Can, can I add something to that? I think, you know, to, to Leanna's point, um, uh, one of the things that we have to dispel, I find with, you know, in, in dyads and in relationships in general, is this idea that if somebody told me to do it, then I must not be sincere about it. And this is something that I struggle with, you know, couples and 
and others who say, well, well, you're only doing that because the therapist said, and it's not true. It may be true that I'm only doing that because the therapist said, but I care and I want to improve and do something differently and better. I might not have the words on my own to figure out how to express that. But now the therapist may have shared with me how I can do that. And I'm only doing it and saying it because I care, not because the therapist said I have to do it to check it off the list. So if, if the child gets the sense from the parent that the parent is genuine about it, and part of that's coming from the fact that they sat in the session with mom and therapist, and therapist showed mom and demonstrated how to do it. Now mom has the tool to do it, and mom's taking it seriously. I think that's a great message to the child. Yes. I think, too... Um... I, I mentioned earlier that one of the one of the benefits of doing family therapy is that it communicates that everyone in the family plays a part in making it in making it better. And so by me giving a directive to the mom, you know, we're not just focusing on the child being more compliant. We're focusing on mom has a task to do and I'm asking mom to do this task in the session, which again communicates to the children, oh it's not just me the child that has to work on my behavior, mom also has to work on something. Um, so I think, again, it communicates that, you know, the kids have their part to do and mom, and the parents have their part to do as well. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Great. Right. Let's take another question from Yaakov. Go ahead, Yaakov. Thank you, Liba. I have a general question. Kids like fun. How do you how do you take care of the fun that they want when they play and actually assessing and do your work as a therapist? Like you have to assess, you have to, you have to, you have to focus on actually taking care and, and uh, doing therapy and having them having fun while you do it. Mm -hmm. So not totally sure what you're asking. So can you break that down a little bit? Yes, when 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 you sit down with a with a child, the child like has no idea what therapy is all about and what and what you want to them. She, she, the child wants what she looks out for fun. Yeah. So how do you like ha make them have fun while you can actually focus on the therapy? Well, in the video that I just showed you, um, did you do you think the kids were having fun? Um, I, I think so, but I also was thinking that maybe you like set up before that for them, so they so that's why they were participating. Um, well, I mean, you know, this 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 activity that I just showed you in the video is not something I would do in a first session. So there's always activities first that are more geared to joining and engaging, um, but again, using fun, playful activities to do that, right? So yes, um, I think there's a way to, I, I'm not sure I would use the word fun. I prefer the word engaging. So I integrate engaging activities so that therapy is a positive, pleasurable experience. At the same time, we're doing hard work. So yeah, you know, I, I think therapy, that's the point. That, that's the, the point is that you're, you're, you're very focused on a very specific goal to get that goal done during the session. And you're looking to incorporate something exciting, different, fun, um, engaging, uh, engaging, attaching, you know, depending on, on probably what the activity is, but yeah. you're, you're looking for a specific, you know, there, again, there are those therapists who are more just plain process based and wouldn't necessarily care that much for the particular outcome. But mm -hmm. I see, I see you focused on a very particular outcome and uh, it, sort of inducing that in the session. And then I'm assuming that they go home and mom is instructed with some kind of homework to do, you know, to, to focus on praising or, yes? Yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that the end of the eight minutes, the session? Yeah, or? towards the end I say, okay, now, um, you know, mom's job is to go home and, you know, look, um, and um, look for, um, you know, desirable behavior, look for at least, you know, at least four times a day to, you know, use label praise for each of the kids. Uh -huh. um, and I, I, I give her a little notebook um, that I call a brag book. And she's to write down, you know, one sort of label praise statement um, each day and then read it aloud to the kids. So they, you know, creates this brag book of label praise. Um, 
And then how many people do also, we know that actually need a brag book? I mean, <laughs> brag without the book. Yeah. Okay. So it's just a way, again a way to make it a little bit more structured and formalized. Right. right. Um, and then the kids, um, of course, um, you know, you could give them homework as well. Uh, go home and um, and and be miss you know, miss good listener. Uh, so yeah. Yes, I want to just show a um, a quick screenshot of some of the twelve books that were written by Liana. So they're all over Amazon. Um, uh, that's pretty pretty impressive list there. Thank you. Okay. Um, Liana, that's, you actually get a better deal on my website. Ah. You can buy them on Amazon, but uh, okay, so at the end of tonight, I'll give, uh, I'll how give you about, a discount. How about if you tell us what your website is, so those of us who are on now and okay. want to take a sneak peek can do that. I'll type it into the chat box. So it's just my name. It's lianalowenstein.com. And I'll give you a discount code. Um, so this is for anyone in, I don't know if, if all of you are in, in the U.S., but this if anyone in North America can access the books this way um, on my website. Um, if you use the code PC14, so P is in Peter and C is in Cat, PC14, that'll give you 20% off all of my books. And if you buy any four books, you get an extra 10% off, so you can get 30% off. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, and there's lots of free stuff on my website too. Nice. Um, what, do we, what do we do for those in, in Europe and the other places? Uh, so if you're in Europe, um, you could buy my books from, well, on my website, you'll see links to uh, Gazelle uh, Bookstore um, or Gazelle Booksellers for, for those of you who are in Europe. Um, for any, if there's anyone here from Australia, I have a distributor in Australia and there's a link on my website for that. And so anyone outside of North America, Europe, like if you're in Israel, for example, just email me. There's a link on my website to email me and I'll uh, put you in touch with a way to access my books. Amazing. I, I personally would love to see another demo. Do you have another demo handy? Or um, I could um, just hold on a second. Sure. Any and does anyone else have any questions about this? Because I'm I'm okay. Let's take a question from Tapeco Wall. While Leanne is looking for another demo, go ahead, Tapeco. No, I was just curious, and it's along with what the other question was. Like with teenagers, I think would be much more resistant to this because they want to point out, "Oh, mom, you're just doing this because they told you to," and they're they're much more resistant to this. So I was wondering maybe if she has a tape with teenagers type or. How she well, would, um, you know, let me just, let me, let me answer that. And then I'll show a video. So I, I don't have a video showing, showing um, with, with teens at the moment that I could show um, of a family session. I have, I have some videos of doing some, some playful stuff with teens, but that aren't family sessions, but, um, but let me give you an example of um, an activity that I might use with a parent and a teen. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's using phototherapy. Um, so it's asking the parent to bring in a picture of themselves as a teen. Um, and then the teen gets to interview their parent about the teen in the picture. So basically about them. So, and I give them a whole list of questions to ask their parent. So I say, so the teen says to the parent, okay, well, when you look at this picture of yourself as, you know, a 15 year old, um, what were some of your favorite things to do? Um, how did you get along with your family? What kind of rules did you have to follow? What happened if you broke a rule? Um, what were some of your worries? Um, what were your relationships like with peers? Uh, what made you happy? Um, so, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then afterwards, we process. So I ask the parent, and and of course you're preparing the parent ahead of this. You're you know explaining to the parent kind of your goal here is to just kind of help your child empathize with you and help your you empathize more with your child. Um, open communication, build attachment. Um, so they're prepared in advance. Um, and then I'm asking, so what was it like for you, parent, mom, dad? Uh, to answer these questions um, and to reflect back on what it was like for you as a teen. Um, and teen, what was it like for you asking your parent these questions and 
what kinds of things did you learn about your parent that maybe you didn't know before about what their life was like as a teen? Um, what's similar or different to um, how your parents' life was to how your life is now as a 15-year-old, for example? So um, you might not think of this as a play therapy technique, but you know, play therapy is a really broad term. It's really kind of the use of play or expressive arts techniques, photo therapy, art, puppets, sand tray, engaging activities that go beyond just traditional talk therapy to help families communicate and build attachments and um, you know, improve family relationships. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. an example of a activity with teens. Great. So I, I could I could show another clip. Um, I could show uh, a puppet technique. Do, do you have something with art? Because we had said we're going to talk art? about art. Yeah. Um, I could show um, I could show um, the family gift. OK, that one you described already. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to think of what I have as a family technique. So I have a puppet one. I have the family gift. Let's do the puppet. Um, that sounds exciting. I have I have a game of um, a family, um, a bereaved family, um, using a game, or the puppet. Your choice. Puppet sounds excited, exciting, but game sounds okay. So let me show the puppet one. Okay. It's, it's, and it's also Fal and her, her, her two daughters again. So, um, can you see it? It's not sheared yet. No. So this? Yeah, I think I have to. You have to share screen. Share screen. So hold on a second, because I, yeah, if it's not. Okay, I think this will work. But I don't know how to. Um, you can minimize it over there, or you can probably just click click the um, video on this, and it'll disappear. Oh. There? See it now? Yep. Yes, okay. All right, so this activity is called Family Puppet Show. And as you can see, we've got a- You can see it and hear it? We can. Okay. A bunch of puppets for you to choose from. So the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is for each of you to choose one puppet. So now you guys are gonna make up a story all together with the puppets. And it has to be a new story. So not one that you already know, like not like Cinderella or one that you already know. Okay, so it has to be a new story and your story that you're going to make up with the puppets has to have a beginning and a middle and an ending and has to include all three of your puppets. I'm going to watch you while you're practicing and then once, you're, once you have your story all made up, you're going to perform your puppet show for me. I'm going to be the audience. How do the puppets know each other? Let's He's walking and meets the bunny and they become friends, right? And Serena, yours is that they're at a party. Yeah? Okay, we can mix them together. Mix them, so, okay. So first, the bunny and the monkey are walking together. Mm -hmm. And then they both meet each other. Yeah. And then the monkey um, and then she says, Do you, do you 
you want to do that idea, Alina? Okay, so let's do the, because we have to do a beginning and middle and end, right? So how should we begin it? Like, how should we begin our story? What's a good way to start a story, you think? Mm -hmm. Once upon a time. Once upon a time? Once upon a time. Okay, so then, so then what happens? So they bump into each other and become friends, and they bump into Bear, and they all become friends because they realize they're all going to the same party, right? So I could see that you guys were working very hard to practice your story. So can you, are you ready to perform your puppet show? Are you ready, guys? Yeah? Yes. Okay. okay. And I'm going to watch it very carefully. And... What do you think, monkey, bear, and bunny, was the lesson in your story? Because in that part they went separate ways and they're angry. Yeah. Um, it's always better to go like through a challenge with friends. It's always better to go through a challenge with friends. That is an amazing lesson to be learned. That's the daughter of a therapist talking. <laughs> So that was just one example of a process question. I, I stop it there because when I use this as a training video in my workshops or webinars, I stop it and I, I then put it to the audience to say, okay, so if you're the family therapist, what would you do next? What kind of process questions might you ask? How would you ask them? And notice when I was asking my this one process question, I stayed within the metaphor. So I didn't ask the adults, the humans. Uh, I asked, you know, I asked the puppets. Mm. Um, so I'm staying within the metaphor, which again sort of makes it less threatening to to communicate. And, and there must have been some assessing or some information that you gleaned from watching uh, these three people interact with each other. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So again, if this was a, a workshop, I would I would say, okay, let's use the chat box to uh, to to you know observe. what did you observe? What did you observe? What did you learn about this family? Uh -huh. through this puppet show. Now, this yeah. is not a, a workshop, but that's, you know, right. that's how I would use this as a training opportunity. Excellent. Okay, I wonder if anyone has any questions or comments about that particular uh, uh, little vignette. Liba, you're still raising your hand. I hope I hope it, your blood circulation is... <laughs> okay, go ahead. Still alive. Um, yeah, I mean, the, just a, I guess a more general question. Um, but that, that video was so cute. It had me laughing the whole time. They're just so adorable. Um, probably see the cutest things in your office. Yeah. Um, do you prepare for every session before the session? Do you know the direction you're going to take once you complete the assessment process and figure out your goal? Do you know like exactly where you're going to go with this? So... Um, once I've completed, once I've 
completed an assessment, uh, I always, for all of my clients, develop a treatment plan. Um, and so, yes, I'm going into sessions prepared with what's my what's my goal with this client or with this family, what I'm hoping to achieve, um, and what what technique or techniques might I use um, to achieve that specific goal for this particular session. I'm thinking about you know why might I use this particular intervention with this client or this family in this session? How what's my goal? How am I going to process it? How am I going to introduce it, bring closure um, and process it? And then, of course, you can't predict um, everything that's going to happen. You're also going, you know, within, you know, in the moment, you're going with what's going on. Um, but, we, you know, we've talked about sort of directive interventions tonight, um, but I do want to highlight that I'm an integrative prescriptive therapist. So I combine lots of different theoretical approaches and techniques in my clinical work, mm -hmm. uh, including um, non-directive, more non-directive child-centered play therapy. So, you know, within a session, I might do something very directive and then I might shift to non-directive. Um, and so um, I might use more cognitive behavioral th therapy techniques with one client, or I might use filial therapy with another client. So I'm very much prescriptively thinking about what the needs of the client or the family are and the best theoretical approach to achieve the, the family's needs. That comes along with ongoing assessment as you, as you're observing, you know, what's working and what's, what's, uh, you know, the various personalities in the room and, and chemistry in the room, I'm assuming that you make those choices judiciously. Yes, mm -hmm. of course. Okay. Let's take a question from Mindy. Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering, how do you decide when to do family therapy and who to invite to the therapy room? Because in this example, specifically, you have the mother and two daughters. Are there more family members? Who's the father? Um, how do you decide in general if you should work with a whole family, you should work with one client? Um, so I think that's a good question. Um, in the in the this these two videos that you saw, um, there's the it's just two kids and the mom. Uh, there is a dad, but um, this, the purpose of this was really just to do a, a demonstration. It's not an actual client. If it was an actual client, um, if I was actually working with this family, I I would be inviting everybody and and and. I don't want to use the word insistent, but I'm very much uh, wanting everybody in the family to attend. Um, if it's a family with eight kids, two parents, I'm really wanting everyone to attend, including infants. Now, while the infant infants or toddlers aren't able to participate necessarily in a, <laughs> a directive uh, intervention, really family therapy is with everybody in the family. Um, and you're watching the dyma dynamics. So, you know, how do the parents, um, you know, attend to the needs of all the kids in the family when there's, you know, eight kids, for example. So I, I guess I'm a, a strong advocate for everybody in the family attending or everybody in the home um, attending whenever possible and explaining to parents why and the benefits of everybody coming. Well, when, that, that's so interesting. Go ahead, Mindy. I guess that just boils down to when do you decide to do family therapy? If you're working with just a child, uh, right. will you possibly work just with a child or just a child and the mother, or do you always do family therapy? If right. So again, it always family. boils down to doing a good comprehensive assessment, developing a treatment plan, and then within the treatment plan and the interventions that you're thinking of for the different treatment goals, you're thinking about, well, what modality is best? So um there are some treatment goals that might be more appropriate for an individual session with the child. Some goals might be more appropriate for a parent consultation session. Um, and some goals might be more appropriate for a family session. So uh, again, I'm, I'm very integrative in my approach, uh, integrating different theoretical approaches, but also integrating different modalities, individual therapy, family therapy, parent consultation. So it depends on what your goals are and what modality you think is going to be most appropriate to achieve that goal. Leanna, how do you work with so many moving parts? I tried working with an adult family of eight people or, or you know, teenagers and adults, 
um, a family of, I think it was eight children or eight people. And it's, there's so many moving parts um, yeah. that it's, it's almost impossible to give everybody their own attention or, or even to facilitate enough attention from the different parts to the ones who, those who need it. You don't find that to be too overwhelming and, and things like that. Well, you know, again, um, I think that um, in there's a real there's a difference between assessment and 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 treatment. First of all, mm -hmm. I think in an assessment, you really do want yeah. ideally everybody coming because yeah. yeah. that's how you're going to get you know a flavor for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's a lot going on in a family session. Thus, it can be helpful to videotape. But I think you can very much join with each member of the family, even when it's a large family. Um, in treatment, maybe there's a benefit to, you know, the parents and let's say one of the kids, but is that really family therapy? Are you then again feeding into the, the dynamics of focusing on the identified patients, scapegoating that particular child in the family? So yeah, I understand that there's a lot of moving parts and it might feel very overwhelming uh, to work with a whole, you know, a large family in a session. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that um, there are a lot of benefits. You have to think about it um, and think about what's going to be most effective. And so it's really, it's really a question of what you're trying to accomplish and how you're, how you're accomplishing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's also some strategies that I might use if it is a large family. Um, so uh, one approach that I might use is, um, let's say we're playing a game. Um, I might team, you know, put them in, onto teams. So sort of put the family into subgroups and have, let's say, an older child with a younger child. Uh, or, you know, divide the family into three or four subgroups. Um, you know, so there's there's lots of different ways to kind of manage what might feel very overwhelming with it's a large family. That's one example. Another example is, um, you know, it's always really important to establish some rules. One, when one person is talking, everybody else is listening. Um, we're being respectful. Mm -hmm. um, if I see hurts happening, hurts, you know, physical hurts, hurts with words, I'm going to call timeout. Mm -hmm. So that, because it's important that everyone here feels safe. Um, and then I might, uh, you know, assign, um, you know, a family member to be kind of, you know, each session, a different family member to be the police officer whose job it is to enforce these rules that we've established. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to manage the kind of the chaos yeah. that you're kind of thinking about like, oh, I can't do this. It's going to be too overwhelming. I can't work with the whole family. There's ways to manage that. Okay. Okay. Castrilli, you had a question. Did you want to? Did you want us to ask? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much. I really learned a lot. Um, I I would love to circle back for a moment. Um, you were mentioning how you really integrate a lot of different approaches. Um, <clears throat> it seems like um, you know I I don't exclusively work with children. I do some play therapy. I also do um, a fair bit of couples work. Um, it seems like there's a real split in like the directive versus non-directive um, world. Um, I imagine not everyone here is like um, a play therapy enthusiasts. Um, I would love if you could just elaborate a little more and like how how does that being that integrated sort of uh, approach kind of work for you? Well, um, so you are right. There is a little bit of um, in-house fighting uh, in, for some in terms of what's better, directive versus non-directive. There are those who have been trained in what we call, you know, child-centered play therapy, which is a very non-directive approach um, and feel that that's the only way to be. There are some that are very much trained in, let's say, cognitive behavioral approaches, and that's the only way to do this work effectively. As an integrative therapist, um, I feel like I'm getting the best of both worlds by integrating directive and more non-directive methods or different theoretical approaches. Um, on the other hand, there's a risk of being haphazard. Um, you know, I think there are some therapists who call themselves integrative or eclectic um, without 
always giving thought to what theoretical approach they're using with a particular client or family and why. So yes, I think there's a lot of benefits to being integrative because you do kind of get the best of both worlds when you're integrating directive and non-directive, but you want to be very um, careful about why you're integrative and how you're going to be integrative. Yeah, because I, I am sorry, Hannah, I'll, I'll, I'll yield the floor in one second. I just, um, I, I guess it was interesting to me because I've mostly been tra trained in child centered um, in my journey so far. Um, I actually like really noticed like a recall within myself, like just how descript how prescriptive you were being. Um, and I, I read widely. I'm, I'm definitely going to do some more prescriptive trainings at, at some point soon. But I, could, we, could we just shout out to Leanna's trainings right here? Leanna, I'm understanding that you do quite a bit of trainings. I do. Can we find um, that on the website? So you can find, so I have some upcoming things. I have lots of recorded trainings mm -hmm. and I also do home visits. So uh, if you would uh, like me to uh, come to the community. Not unannounced though, right? Pardon me? <laughs> not unannounced home visits. No, okay, no. I don't have to worry. So, um, you know, if you want me to come to your community, your agency, get in touch. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I guess, thanks for the shout out, my sham. I'm gonna go check those out. But I, I, I guess, I, I don't know. I just wondering like how you got to that. Like, I guess I'm, I'm looking for a little peek beyond the presenter, like how you got to that point where you, like, let's say child centered, the real child centered purists would basically run you out of town if they saw you being that um, directive. So I'm curious, like how you still feel comfortable doing child centered, but then taking off that hat and, and switching over. Yeah. That's such a big question, hard to answer in like a quick 30 second response. Um, Eliana Gill, who's one of my heroes, um, published a book a number of years ago. Um, I can't remember the main title, but the subtitle was Blending Directive and Non-Directive Therapy. Um, and so I guess I would say, you know, have a look at that book, Eliana, anything written by Eliana Gill is amazing. Um, and she really speaks to kind of the blending, how she came to blend the directive and the non-directive and why. And, um, and so I think that's a, a, a quick way for me to respond to that by saying, you know, do some reading um, by some of our pioneers in the field. Um, or, or of course, you could watch Eliana Gill's uh, presentation on Mondays with my she, which was in our archives. So take a look at that. Okay. I, I also, you know, Kasriel, you know, just to, to the, speak to the point, I think, uh, it, it, you know, all of us sort of start somewhere and then, and then evolve over time. And, you know, it, it's really difficult to stick to one pure approach when you start to see different, pro, so many different profiles of clients or prototypes. And some of them um, benefit, you know, I like to say, there's certain teenagers who walk into the office where you go right at them and that's how they respond best. And then there's others who you have to be really gentle and, and, you know, you have to don careful gloves, you know, in, in how you work with them. So you, you, there's a part of us that has to work with a certain degree of intuition and then develop um, uh, different, I don't know if you want to call them modalities or different styles in engaging attaching and interacting with different kinds of clients. Yeah. And I think I would also say that um, the beauty um, and, and the rationale for me of being a prescriptive or integrative play therapist, therapist, um, is that I, I strongly believe that no one size fits all. Um, there are some clients where I might only use child-centered play therapy. There are some clients where I would only use trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. There are some clients or families where I would only use filial therapy. Um, and there are some clients where I'm integrating several different theoretical approaches. So um, I guess that's where I'm coming from. Uh, I certainly trained as a child-centered play therapist, but I've also been trained in other theoretical approaches. And I really like um, I, I really see the benefits of being trained in a variety of approaches 
and prescriptively blending them with different clients. Let's take a question from Hannah, who is actually a, quite an accomplished play therapist. Uh, and early, early uh, Mondays with Maishi featured. So go ahead, Hannah. And thanks for coming on. So first of all, I want to say thank you so much for your for your for your writings and workshops and manuals. I've taken I've done quite a few and I've used a lot of it um, working with families. Um, I just wanted to ask you when it comes to um, I don't know if you like like domestic abuse and um, um, working with families that way. Quite a few families I've worked with over the years and used like I said a lot of your stuff but um do you uh will you integrate the um abuse the the parent who's let's say you know abusive it within the session on a regular basis um again it's sort of that's a hard question to answer in a quick response um and I think the only way to respond to that is it depends um you know again it gets down to you know safety comes first especially when there's been, uh, you know, domestic violence. Um, and I would let the, the assessment guide me, but also um, the premise that, uh, that safety does come first. And if I feel that um, having the, um, the abuser in the session would put anyone at risk uh, or shut anyone down, um, then I would, I would be, you know, really cautious about doing that. Um, it might be something that we might work towards, maybe not initially um, having the, um, you know, the abusive parent or, um, in the session, but maybe we would work towards that. Maybe I would work with the couple and the children separately. Uh, you know, I, I guess it sort of right. really does depend on that, but you really want to use, you know, the premise of safety comes first as your guiding principle. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any any uh, last thoughts or questions? It's uh, almost a quarter after ten here in, in our neck of the woods. Any questions for for Liana? Liana, can you tell me what did you write twelve books on? What what twelve topics are there in this uh, domain? Uh, well, um, some of them are just sort of general, um, you know, sort of play therapy techniques books. Some are books that I edited that I didn't write myself, but I edited and I invited therapists, child and family therapists from all over the world to contribute to. So um, for example, Creative Family Therapy Techniques uh, is a book that I edited where there are contributions from family therapists from all over the world, games and art and puppet techniques, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I've written two books on working with children dealing with divorce, um, a bereavement book, uh, book, uh, creative CBT interventions for children with anxiety. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot of, a lot of creativity and like novel ideas or, or novel techniques that, that you're sharing. Is that what it is? When, when Hana and, um, Liba talk about what they've, you know, picked up from you and, and studied from you, is it these variations of techniques to engage? Is that really what, what you're sharing? Yeah, creative ideas, creative interventions. I guess my, you know, my 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 brand. I'm what I'm. One of the things I'm known for is um, engaging techniques to mm -hmm. use with children and families. But um, there's a part of me that doesn't like that um, that 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 definition because I think some people see me as the techniques lady, mm -hmm. and I think that um, it. I want to emphasize that it's so much more, you know, a technique is not therapy. That's right. It's merely a tool to facilitate the therapeutic process. It's what you do with a technique that makes right. it therapy. So it almost, it almost cheapens the process by, by seeing you as the technique lady, but at the exactly. same time, still exactly. creative. The theory is so important. So yeah, people are hungry for techniques, right. but it's really what you do with the technique that's going to make a therapy. So that's I want right. to just emphasize that. Yeah. Get excited about the techniques, but use the techniques in a ethically sound, theoretically sound manner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to really thank you for coming on. You didn't have to do this for us and you did. And, and it was a great um, exposure for our therapists. Um, so again, it's greatly appreciated. You know, it's late at night where you're at 10, 15, which is probably past many people's bedtimes. Um, 
But again, thank you for coming on and sharing this. Thank you for your works and your books and um, your website, which shares so much information and um, tonight's offers with the 20% off plus um, of any materials and books that are that are for sale. You're welcome. And I, I want to just say one more thing, which is that um, I've tried to make my website a hub of free resources. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of free stuff on my web website as well. There's a free ebook of techniques. Um, there's articles on all kinds of topics, articles for clinicians, but there's also, also articles for parents on parenting issues. Mm -hmm. um, so check that out. And there's links to, I have a YouTube channel. Yes. Um, so that. links to my YouTube channel social media, et cetera. Amazing. Well, thank you very much for all you do. And thanks for coming on. And uh, everybody be sure to check out leannalowenstein.com. Simple as that. Simple as pie. And um, have a good night. Thank you again. Thank you for having me.